In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for every man. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we continue with our Lenten lecture series. We are on, um, what number of lectures is this now? This is like lecture 54 of <laughs> <laughs> section three of the book. Yes, on uh, Father Matal Meskin's book, uh, Words for Our Time. Um, and we welcome with us uh, tonight a beloved servant, Ave Ibrahim. Ave tonight will speak to us on scripture. It is the third part in, in book one of this two book series. Um, and he will focus on the Canaanite wo woman. Thank you, Abuna, so much. Is, is this okay? Is the mic okay? Thank you, um, all 73 of you uh, that are here, and the people in the back that don't have a seat. Um, <coughs> So it was um, when Abuna discussed with me that I was going to speak about the Canaanite woman, I immediately asked him, what's the talk after that or before that? Because it's one of the most, um, it's one of the topics that generates some heartburn, and I think I know why. And we're going to discuss why today. Um, tonight's passage is really a passage about redemption, um, really truth and redemption or truth and love. And that's the subtitle of, um, of tonight's lecture, so to speak, because I really want us to kind of hone in on that. And the reason why this topic sometimes gives us a little bit of a heartburn, especially the dialogue between our Lord and Savior and this Canaanite woman, also referred to as the Syrophoenician woman, is because we've lost understanding of truth and love. Um, and it's interesting because I think um, all of the commentaries really, really understood, earlier commentaries really, really understood what tonight's passage was all about. And as you progress towards time and you get more and more in modern day, people start thinking like, hmm, I'm uncomfortable with this. I'm not sure about this. And I'll admit, I, it was a bit of a challenge, but it, I, I think God humbled me a little bit personally and made me realize, no, no, I, I need to be grounded in the idea of truth and love for me to understand what's happening here and to be really, really firm in the heart of Christ. And so I want us to read together. Um, if anybody has their uh, Coptic Reader Bible or their version Bible available, if we could open up to Mark chapter 7, verses 25 to 30. I want somebody who wasn't picked on as a kid to read in class. This is your opportunity. And I think you, you'll have to use the mic. The first one that has it ready. Mark 7, verses 25 to 30. Demi, can you read for us? So a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syro Syrophoenician. Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. And yet the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For the, say for the saying, Go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying in the bed. So that's one 
of the two references to this story. Because I want somebody to pull up Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Who has it open? I feel like people have it open and they're pretending to still scroll. So they don't. <laughs> David, can you read for us? Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So who can share with me a little bit about the context here? Yeah, just in their own words, what, what's happening? We have a woman, right? W well, first Christ departs away, and he is trying to withdraw from the crowds, and he wants to be by himself, and he ends up in a territory right, of um, Tyre and Sidon. And then, by himself, we know that Christ doesn't do anything unintentionally. And Christ often breaks the fourth wall. Who, who knows, who watches, like, cartoons and comics where the cartoon character kind of winks at the screen and tells you that I know you're watching and I know you'll be watching this later on. Christ does that, does that all the time in Scripture. And he does things intentionally for us to benefit from. And so, yes, this story did happen. And yes, there's a historical context to this. But also equally as true is Christ, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to us. And remember, truth and love, okay? And so Christ did not depart away just like he didn't hang out in Samaria by Jacob's well unintentionally. He went and withdrew himself in Tyre and Sidon for a reason, and the reason will be made clear to us. And he meets this Canaanite or Syrophoenician woman who's pleading with him to save her daughter from a severe demon possession. And there's like a qualifier in all of the passages. It's a severe demon possession, not just a regular demon possession, a severe one. I don't know what that means. I think all demon possessions are severe. But this is a severe one. And then she tells him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. What's interesting here is sometimes the, the term, O Lord, um, it could refer to master or sir, or it could refer to the theological word or theological meaning is as in Lord himself. We don't know what was inferred here, but we know that there's a progression in her statements, right? And she tells them, have mercy on me, O son of David. What's interesting also is how does a Canaanite woman know about Davidic prophecy, like Jewish Davidic prophecy? And we'll talk about the history of the Canaanites and how they were considered enemies. And I'm sure you've read the book as well, the specific chapter. But she's supposed to be completely detached from the Jewish culture and their Jewish theology and frame of mind. But she says, O Lord, son of David. And he's quiet at first and doesn't respond. Then the disciples stepped in and begged her to be sent away. We also don't know whether or not they stepped in to either really, really press for him to do something and heal her daughter, 
or they stepped in just to expedite this and like ignore her and actually shoo her off. We don't know that, right? Like we don't know the heart of the disciples in this. But we know the heart of Christ, and we'll talk, we'll get to that. He's quiet at first and does not respond. Then the disciples stepped in and begged her to be sent away. And St. John Chrysostom thinks that they were doing it because they had pity on her. Um, but then in the, in the book that we're reading, it seems like another contemplation is that they were just tired of her wailing and annoying them this whole time. Then Christ finally answers and said some, says something interesting to her. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She then knelt, and the word used here in Greek is actually intended for full prostration, full matani. She knelt, meaning her forehead touched the floor in an act of worship. So it starts off as, O son of David, right? Help my daughter. Then she kneels in full prostration and then says, Lord, help me. And then he answered, it is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This is the line that causes a lot of heartburn. And immediately, if, you've just, if you're just encountering this for the first time, you're like, dogs? Christ is calling somebody, our Lord and Savior Christ is calling somebody a dog? That's weird, right? And your natural reaction is, that's unlike him. And I think that's telling because, like we said in the beginning, it's because our understanding of truth and love has been chipped at for so many years. And internally in our spiritual life, there's a little bit of a blind spot to what truth is. That's why it causes a little bit of heartburn. And so she quickly responds, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then he tells her, and us, right? Because he broke the fourth wall. A woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Great is your faith. Great is your faith. Um, in the book, there are certain passages call how great of a statement that is in terms of how much Christ says, O oh, you of little faith, to so many other people. But then he says, great is your faith. And then the other example, and I'll get to that, when he talks to, centurion, uh, to the centurion who had his um, servant sick and was healed and only asked for a word from Christ to be healed, for Christ not to make the way all the way to his house to actually heal him. And then Christ says, I have not seen faith greater than this in all of Israel. So great is your faith. Strange. They're not children, direct children of the promised land. They're not necessarily God's chosen people, but great is their faith. So this is really perplexing because, again, he calls this woman a dog, and then she worships him, and then he says, great is your faith. And she doesn't respond with a knee-jerk reaction that conveys any offense taken. She's not offended at all. Like she actually doubles down into the statement that he makes. You're a dog. I'm, I'm not going to give bread that was intended for my children to dogs. She goes, well, even dogs eat scraps from their master. And so let's talk about the elephant in the room was it her ethnicity? Was it because she was a Gentile and she wasn't Jewish? It was, was Christ racist? Was he? Certainly not. Because like we said, the centurion, he responds to him and he says, there's no greater faith. He says, he marveled and said to them that followed, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And then when Christ tries to give us an example of somebody who should be really an exemplary figure for mercy and compassion. He doesn't say the good Jew. He says the good Samaritan. He tells us about this figure who really underscores this 
outside disenfranchised person when it comes to the Jews, and yet he does everything so much better than them. So it's not her ethnicity. Was he a misogynist? Is it because she's a woman? No, right? Because we are in the middle of the prodigal son and the Samaritan woman. Next week, we have a woman who is not a Jew, and he talks to her with so much compassion, and he's the only source of kindness to her. And we have other examples of social pariahs that he allows to touch, to touch him and be healed by him. We have the example of the bleeding woman who had to walk around and say, I am unclean, I am unclean. And yet, he chose to have an encounter with her, a deep encounter with her. So it's not because she's a Gentile or her um, gender in any capacity, because that's not the heart of our Savior, who opens his arms on the cross for anyone and everywhere. So the book that this wonderful church is, is reading is offering us some insight as to where does this dog reference come from and why was she coined as such? Because it really was her truth. And I think I want us to get comfortable by that, that this was her truth, okay? And then we'll segue into what is our truth. So now this, was, this woman was a Canaanite who worshiped Beelzebul, um, which was really great, by the way, that, that um, the explainer of Beelzebub and Beelzebul. No, I'm not going to ruin it for those who haven't gotten there yet. You should have read it before this talk. Um, but it, it's fascinating, really, really cool. You and I are going to connect on that. No one else knows what's happening. <laughs> but she's worshiping Baal, and she's a Canaanite. And he's saying it was a base and depraved worship, one which distorted human nature through its obscenities. I cannot say more than that. It was an unclean religion. Human bodies were subjected to, to the filthiest abuses in honor of this God. They even slaughtered children in offering to Baal, which is mentioned in the Old Testament. Now he told her, woman, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Here he exposes the vile depths of her worship. He uncovers the sordid depth of her life. She was just offering lip service. She was not just offering lip service worship to Beelzebul, but participating to the fullest degree. I don't think there was any accusation here, and the Canaanite woman did not feel that Christ was scolding her. Truth and love. No accusation, no insult. This was truth. And so the Canaanites, as the book mentions, and as we know from scri Scripture, came from Canaan himself, the son of Ham. Ham was a beloved son of who in the Old Testament? Who can tell me? Ark, Ark, Ham, son of Noah. Thank you for whispering that. We, we don't do Bible trivia enough here. Right? Yeah, <laughs> on the retreat. So um, Ham in the Bible was said to be cursed. Why was he cursed? Again, he was a beloved son of Noah. And the Bible says that he betrayed his sonship to Noah. How did he betray it? At best, at best, this is with like the most oblivious and surface level interpretation of what the scripture says. He mocked his father's nakedness. He went into the tent and saw his father, father drunk and naked and walked out and mocked it with his two other brothers. At worst, if you read Leviticus, he did something beyond animalistic. He exposed his father's nakedness, and if you read what that means in Leviticus, it could be any of a heinous set of sins that are all related to, again, like sexual animalistic tendencies, okay? Read Leviticus, I think, chapter six, I'm not sure. Exposing your father's nakedness, really, really bad. And so here is Ham, he was a beloved son and reduced himself to an animal based on his animalistic tendencies 
and what he did to his father. He had a wonderful seat at the table, and then he chose to abandon that seat and act like an animal. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that he was kicked out from that chair. It means that he walked away from it and chose to be this way. Dogs were seen back then as wild scavengers, only seeking their best interest. They weren't um, like Jaden, uh, domesticated, wonderful puppies um, who have a relationship, a prolonged relationship with their owners or masters or anything like that. Um, dogs were considered wild and they were considered scavengers and they um, were the example of animalistic behavior because they would just, they were very opportunistic. They would come trying to beg for food and they would walk away. They would grab the food and then just run away or they would just look for somebody to mate with. And so there was really no dignity in their behavior and again, an example of animalistic tendencies. That was their truth, right? So last Sunday, we encountered another man who left his sonship and lived as an animal even filthier than the dogs. Just like Ham, right? The ancestor, the great ancestor of the Canaanites, who this woman, the Canaanite woman descended from, the prodigal son, had a wonderful seat at the table, Bear with me. I, I promise this will all make sense because I'm just piecing it together. The prodigal son had a wonderful seat at the table. And instead of sitting there and engaging in a loving relationship with his father, like the dogs, he went and he was opportunistic. He just wanted his portion and walked away and ended up leaving, living with the animals. Okay? He was intended to be a son, and he lived the reality of animals. In his father's eyes, he was always a beloved son. Unfortunately, he walked away from that. This is the truth, and there's nothing that should offend us about it, right? Like, we don't get offended by saying that, and what I just described. And this is how we should see the story. St. Athanasius, um, in the book on the Incarnation, he says that, when we walked away from God, all of humanity, like starting from Adam and Eve, and we progressed, we progressed so much that we devolved into very animalistic behavior. We became even worse than the animals. And interesting enough, if you think about the beautiful story and events of the incarnation itself, where was the first place that Christ descended to? Where was the first place? Where did he, where was he born? In a manger, in the place of the animals. And not only just randomly, but he went even below the animals because it says that he was on a bed of hay where the animals eat. So he came down to lift us up from where we were, even below the animals, and then eventually rose us up. And so that is our life outside of the sonship that we have, that we really are entitled to through the Holy Spirit and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are his children, but unfortunately we walk away from that seat. And we tend to live sometimes, sometimes, as if we're not children. And by the way, Christ also, it wasn't just uh, the Gentiles that he called animals. He did call the, the Pharisees broods of vipers because of their animalistic tendencies. And vipers, if anybody has watched Animal Planet, uh, vipers tend to be very cannibalistic. They eat each other sometimes even after mating, and they're very, very toxic. And so he's trying to describe something that they lost their humanity. And so, back to the Canaanite woman. I imagine, in her, I imagine her coming in a dress full, steeped in Canaanite culture, because back in the day, your outerwear represented where you're coming from and who you're worshiping. So imagine jewelry, clothing, makeup, graven images. They used to have little token idols that they would wear on them 
as part of their jewelry, Baal or any of a, and you see that even with the Greeks, all of their jewelry represented some kind of form of idolatry. And she's coming in desperate, and she's fully enclosed in the culture that she was in, and she has these graven images on her. Graven images where dehumanizing orgies took place. Graven images that might have heard the screams of human child sacrifices as they were being burnt alive. Graven images that summoned the same demons that entered in her daughter. So I want you to understand, like, here's a woman. Everything about her is saying, I am not a child of God everything about her, right? Down to the territory where they were. And the, and the folks, the Canaanites, were not just against the Jewish God, but they were adamantly um, opposing him on an ongoing basis. And she approaches a healer. And this is where the trajectory of events comes in and why we see the projection of what Christ does so, so well when it comes to all of us. She approaches him not knowing who he really is. To him, he's a healer. She knows that he's supposed to be called the son of David. She probably thought that was her in. She heard from the other Jews in neighboring towns that that's what they refer to him. And he was her only hope. And maybe at that point in her heart, she might have been a little bit like a dog who's opportunistic, who wants to come and get the healing and walk away unchanged. Dogs typically, when they get a meal and they sit with you at the table, do they change their nature? They will still remain dogs. And then... His silence is doing something that we can't see. And she asks him, please help my daughter, heal my daughter. Here's my state. Here's my reality. Then he finally tells her, there are others here that I came for that recognize my voice as sheep do to their shepherds, but they have been lost. He first says, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. And Christ also said, my sheep recognize, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. And he's saying, Habibdi, I don't think you know me. Like, I came for the lost sheep. And at least they know of me and they know my words. Do you want to follow me and only me? Because for sheep, they tend to just have one shepherd. Do you at least want to be made mine? Do you want to let go of all the other things that you've been following? All the false shepherds that you have in your life? Then she falls down and prostrates. And she falls down in worship. And her worship is a response to that. And we could think of it as a response of, I'm desperate. I have no one but you. Everything and everyone else has failed me. And so Christ, you're seeing, he's breaking her down in terms of allowing her to see who he really is. He's not just a healer. He's not someone that she's going to come in and get healed and walk away, as, as so many other people had. And there were lepers that were clean that didn't even get a chance to look back. The paralytic man didn't even know who healed him. For the longest time, he didn't recognize him. And Christ answers, will you take your portion and leave as a dog still? Or are you willing to become my daughter and sit at your right place of love and redemption? That's really what's going on. He's trying to tell her, are you willing to change from how you've been living and enter in the place and the seat that I've always had for you? Are you willing to do that? Or will you walk away the same as you've gotten here? 
And with all humility, she responds just like the prodigal son and the publican. She says, I'm not even worthy to be even considered to sit at your chair. I'm not even worthy to sit beside you. Give me the crumbs and I'll sit there. I'm not even worthy. And so her truth, her reality, was met with his love. And nothing changes a person like undeserved love, like an encounter with undeserved love. But the fir first part of that is to have that truth, the truth about ourselves. Psalm 113.7 says, He humbles the proud and lifts up the lowly from the ash heap to sit with princes. And he really did lift her up. He says, Great is your faith. And she became another woman that Christ redeems in front of his Israelite disciples. He tells her, Great is your faith, even though he told Peter, You of little faith. This is a woman who knows what she was doing three weeks ago or four weeks ago. Maybe she would have been in one of those like Canaanite orgies that we've heard about or engaged in child sacrifice or been part of the seance that brought her own daughter. This moment of desperation. He tells her, great is your faith. In the... In the wonderful book that we're reading, it says she knew herself as every sinner knows himself, to be without any right to approach God, and yet she approached. Did she have hope in any good she had done? Did she have an intercessor to plead on her behalf? Did she have a priest to offer a sacrifice for her? Nothing at all. Then what was it, for, what was it that strengthened her? She looked onto Christ and Christ alone. She focused all her faith, her mind, and her heart on him. She trusted not because she had anything to commend her, but because he had all things. She, pen she depended not on her own strength, but upon his. She did not lean upon any promise she had, but upon the promise found in him. When she said, Son of David, she meant to remind him of the promises that foretold him as a Messiah. I think it's really beautiful because... Her example, and I'm sorry, her example is an example um, that gives me hope, at least. And there's this wonderful quote that we have on screen that says, an evident sinner will turn towards good more easily than a secret sinner hiding under the cloak of visible virtues. I'm here with a cross and uh, a Muna Bishoy came in pendant. You don't know what's going on about me behind closed doors, right? But her faith is probably much more great because her truth, she understood her truth a lot more intimately than some of us do. And unfortunately, we never get to the point where we realize that we have been living as dogs this whole time when we're intended to live as his daughters or as his sons. And I think that's the major takeaway. And so how do I start? How do I start? This woman, and thank God for this, she was met with an event that brought her to her knees and brought her face to face with her truth in that moment. We were on the way here, we were talking about God's mercy in terms of how many chances for us to really understand our truth and where we're at and see ourselves fully that we avoid and we escape from. There are so many, in God's mercy, the Coptic reader translation for this, and I know it's really contested in Psalm 50, it says, for you will not be judged, um, Sorry, I have to do the little kid thing where remember, I recite the whole thing. Um, for you will you will be um, you will not be judged when you judge or when you speak. 
Meaning that there will come a time where we'll stand in front of Christ and say, how come you didn't do this? And he'll say, I did that and more. I gave you every single opportunity to tell you that you were living with animals, that at one point you had a seat right next to me and you walked away from. In fact, your name is still on it. I think about as we're approaching Good Friday, I think about how ready Christ was to offer the right-hand thief a seat at his table. That, it, it tells me that it was already prepared for him. And it also tells me that the left thief had also a place at that table too. But one chose to realize like, I'm actually nothing. I'm nothing. I deserve all of this. I am broken. Will you accept me? Just remember me at your kingdom. Again, he brought himself low. And it was a moment where he was crucified on the cross. And it's an example of, like both of them are examples of how at our lowest, we have opportunities to either seek his sonship or his daughterhood or walk away. And so the right-hand thief said, just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Christ responds, Habibi, you're my son. You have a seat at the table. The other thief on the cross didn't even bother. He chose to double down in terms of walking away. He walked away a dog as opposed to a daughter or a son at the table. And so how do we get there? We get there by pausing. And just like the story of the prodigal son, he looked at himself, he looked into himself, or he came at himself and realized, oh, oh, I'm living like an animal, but I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I belong in my father's house. But I'm going to be humble about it because I don't even deserve a spot there. So take me as one of your hired servants. And then Christ, in this example, as the wonderful father, he's the one that redeems him. He lifts, up, lifts him up from the ash heap. I love the translation, the Arabic translation of the ash heap. It's mezbela. That tells you the extent of what the ash heap is. Ash heap is so watered down. He lifts you up from the mezbela, from like the zebela. And that's where dogs are, typically in the Middle East at that time. And he lets you sit next to princes. And so we pause. And we pause, and, and this is a meditation that I had about, a kind of a prayer that we should get to. And I, I imagine that the Syrophoenician woman or the Canaanite woman had the same thoughts, just like the prodigal son. Thank you for bringing me to this point of honesty. I have harmed myself and did even more harm trying to find healing. I ran into every arm out there except for yours, and I have ended up abandoned and with more wounds. I have betrayed your love more than three times. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but I am here. I know I don't belong where I was, and so I am here. I have heard that you love me. I want to feel it. I want to believe it, but I don't know how to love you back, but I want to love you back. And so gone are the transactional relationship of dogs and pets to their masters where they wait for just a piece that gets handed to them into a relationship of love where actually during this Lent, I get to learn how to love God back. I get to actually see him as my father rather than my master or my healer or my Santa Claus or any of those like false ideas that we have of God. He's certainly a healer, and he's the giver of all good things, but he's not just that. He's our father. And that means a relationship where I sit and dine with him. But the only way to do so is, again, truth and love, is to understand our truth, is to understand that I've been far away from his table to the point where I started acting like dogs like a dog rather than his son or daughter.
And so the pause comes in either voluntary, voluntarily or involuntarily. Sometimes these pauses come in from moments of awe. You know, you can be on a trip somewhere and you're realizing how small you are. And then you realize, God, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. And I'm in awe of your beauty and your wonder and your majesty. To thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Or moments of brokenness. And I, I think I thank God for the moments of brokenness in our lives that help get us a seat at the table. Because anybody who has been on the other side of brokenness that made him or her realize true healing in Christ will actually look at it with so much gratitude. Say, thank God for that. For that woman, it was potentially losing her daughter. But without that reality, without that situation, she wouldn't have realized her truth and how far gone she was from the master's table. Or we could take the simpler way and we can actually schedule these pauses. We could have moments alone, moments of retreat, moments among the saints. Like, and I mean the saints that are living on earth and as well as in heaven. Like set your bar high in terms of seeing God's children live with you and how they live and the joy and the love that they have and going about their life. Set that benchmark high for yourself and you realize my truth is I'm not where they are. But also the ones that have already been victorious are in heaven. I was just watching my mom, uh, actually my sister sent me a wonderful Arabic documentary, and it's a, it has English subtitles. It just came out a couple of weeks ago on one of the martyrs of um, the bombings in, was it, is it Tanta Abuna for Palm Sunday? The martyr's name is um, Shemes Bishoy uh, El Komos Daniel. His father's name is El Omos Daniel, I think. Fact check me on that. Um, but his life was incredible. And just watching that brought me to tears of repentance. I remember my wife was like, are you okay? And I was just like folding clothes and I was just listening to his story. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm nothing like this guy. My benchmark just shot up. And I realized like, I'm nowhere near that. And I realized my truth in that moment, like the need for me to repent in so many different areas. Same thing that happened with the passing of our, our brother Tamer. Just encountering his saintly life also increased the benchmark for me to realize my truth, where I am and where I would like to be. It showed me where I was and where the master's table was and also God welcoming me but all of the choices that I make to keep myself away. And so I want us to walk away with this quote um, because, like I said, nothing changes us or changes a person and causes them to full repentance like undeserved love. And this quote is by St. John Chrysostom, God loves us more than a father, mother, friend, or any else could love, and even more than we are able to love ourselves. And the reality is, Sometimes we don't love ourselves enough to no longer want to be dogs. We don't love ourselves enough to sit at the master's table and want that for ourselves. And so with that, um, I think I'd like to open us up for questions and dialogue in terms of practical takeaways. What are the things that we're doing that keep us perhaps away from the truth and keep us from encountering God's love and being fully invited to partake of the master's meal. And we, we could build off the examples of the, the Canaanite woman, her reality, her truth, something that we can relate to. Any, I'm not gonna force anybody to ask questions or comments, but.
Okay, thank you so much, Abe. That was an amazing talk. Um, we do have it open for questions Is your mic online. On? Oh. Okay. Um, we do have it open for questions online at menti.smsm.nyc, so anyone who's streaming can ask questions too. But it is open for live questions, or if you're a little too shy to speak in the microphone, you can put it on Menti, and I'll still read it anyway. Well, um, one question we like to start with is, what in the book, this is Minardos' question, I'm just stealing it, what in the book like surprised you or really convicted you? What in the chapter? Um, the surprising thing was the fact about Beelzebub and Beelzebul. I'll just share it with everybody. <laughs> so um, you'll hear uh, the the Pharisees accusing Christ of exercising demons by Beelzebub in in, in the, some of the Gospels, and um, it turns out that term was taken from Beelzebul, and. Uh, Zabal means the heights or the high places, and Baal is the god. And so it would be god of the high places. Now, the Jews, because they wanted to mock the Canaanites, they had another word for uh, flies or debin, and so it would be Zabab. And so then they would call Satan or they call their god, god of the flies, rather than god of the heights and so that's why we see beelzebub um but there are so many other references to their god um as beelzebul that was one interesting fact but the, i i feel like the the scripture itself um upon reading it with uh like i guess understanding my truth as i progress it uh per, per, progress through it um I thought it was incredible that this was chosen in between, sandwiched between the prodigal son and the Samaritan woman. And I, I thought it was inspired by the Holy Spirit because next Sunday, we're going to be talking about a woman who Christ allowed for her to realize her truth again. And then she was met with so much love that she didn't even shy away from her truth anymore. Um, and we can... We'll have somebody else talk about that. I don't want to talk about that today. Okay, no questions have come in yet. Um, or one question just came in. Um, can you elaborate more on Christ's interactions? Christ's interactions in general? With women. With women. Oh. He, he definitely restores their dignity, and there are countless examples of that. Um, thank you, Minotis, for asking the question. <laughs> Supposed to be anonymous, guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, he it, it, he restores their dignity um, in so many different examples of that, and they're all greater than the other. Um, and he tends to always choose the women that are on the fringes and the disenfranchised, um, and to elevate them, just like the the psalm says. And actually, I think that psalm verse is taken from Hannah's. Um, prayer, which is also, by the way, if you haven't read the first and second chapter of Samuel, first Samuel, it it almost it has the same dynamic as what we see with the Canaanite woman. Um, the prophet Eli sees Hannah praying in the temple, and he accuses her, and she's praying fervently for a son, and she's been barren for so many years, and then he accuses her of being drunk. And you're like, somebody else would be insulted. I'm like, I'm in the temple of God, and I'm knee-deep in prayer, and I'm just sobbing. But she responds with so much humility as well, and she responds with the truth of her brokenness. And then God fulfills her wish immediately. And it's because her response was filled with humility. Um, and so really, really cool tidbit. If you read that and then read this encounter, you'll realize that the heart of God is consistent throughout. Um, but on the question about women, I mean, I, I love the story of uh, the Samaritan woman in Jacob's well because I, I pray that I am Jacob's well for so many people to encounter Christ one day because I've um, encountered Christ through that story and this understanding, this realization, well, where this woman is avoidant of people 
accusing her of all of these things. And then she goes out and tells them anyways afterwards. She's like, come, let me tell you what this person said about me that I was avoiding talking about with you before. But it's because there's such a new light on it and she has so much hope and love. Um, so that's one of my favorite encounters and, and certainly to sum it up, he always restores their dignity. Okay, why do you think she wasn't offended or surprised when God called her a dog? I, I think um, her brokenness and her desperation, certainly she knew how the Jews saw them. Uh, it, was, it was very, very, um, being a dog was a term that was used um, to describe most Gentiles back in the day. So there, there was a, that was a term that they understood. But I, I think her realization and her desperation of her state um, was way beyond anything, uh, any pride that she might have had that would have prevented her from having healing. And I think she really knew her truth. She realized in his presence, in his holiness, that I'm certainly in need of what he has. Um, and if he sees me as something, this holy man, then I need to start seeing myself as that. And, and I think there was this, um, it, I, I think it's interesting because you see the same thing that happens with Peter in the presence of Christ. Immediately in the first encounter, he says, depart from me for I am a sinful man. Once he's in awe, and it's this like immediate self-reflection and self-awareness where you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm also a dog. I, I don't deserve to be here. And I think that's what happens when you encounter holiness and then you realize then the heart of God is love and that you're allowed to come in and participate in that holiness and he will wrap you up in his finest clothing and put a ring on your finger. All right, um, next question is, is that the only time in the Bible that Christ uses a term that's insulting? Broods of vipers. Um, he says that against the Pharisees. Um, when they were accusing him, um, and they were actually accusing, um, preventing the healing of one of their fellow Jews. And so he was really hurt by that. And what he meant there is that you're eating your own, because that's what vipers do. Like, why would you do that? You're preventing somebody from getting healed, you know? I'm sorry, I'm speaking to you as if you're asking the question. <laughs> I felt like it's the conversation between the I'm, two I'm of us. I'm going to look this way and pretend <laughs> that's my question. Great question. Um, <laughs> is there any other questions, any questions live? Speak now or forever, hold your peace. All right, thank you so much, Abe. Can we have a round of applause? Thank All 73 guys. people here. You guys could come in. There are more chairs up front. Okay, we're just going to switch screens quickly. Um, as we give the announcement. I don't know what's in here. No, we must do it after you. <laughs> All right, so continuing on with our Lenten lecture series, on Monday it would be part three on the scripture on the Epistle to the Romans, and it's Buna Justus. Um, he would be giving it. So. That continues as part of our Lenten lecture series. As we've said before, we're going through the book Words of Our Time by his, um, Father Matthew the Poor. Um, we are, it looks like about halfway through, more than halfway through. So uh, there's just a couple more sessions left. So come take the blessing, attend with us. For whoever was here last year, um, the Friday before Holy Week, we um, have this play, the show called The Way of the Cross. It's a production by SMSM, and we are hoping to do this again this year. So if you are interested to join, um, we need actors, we need voiceovers, we need make, hair and makeup, we need um, all parts of a production. So any way you can help, any way um, narrators, audiovisual, I'm reading it on the bottom right now, um, come and join. So um, the, the production will be on April 26. If you're interested, text FEDI at the number FEDI risk at the number that you see below. And um, when's the next meeting? Okay. 
we believe it's next Wednesday at 8.30. So um, please just text Fede, text Fede, and he'll give you more information of when we're meeting next. Um, Dave. Uh, so there is a North America-wide uh, conference happening in Dallas in September. The registration opened this week. There's uh, only 60 spots per diocese as all the dioceses are working together. So I would recommend uh, signing up early if you're interested. And it will be very exciting. <laughs> but not as exciting as our retreat this weekend. Seats are limited, so it's important to sign up early because every diocese has an allotted number. And there's already over 100 resident, resident <laughs> registrants. Okay. Um, as always, if you are a student, a grad student, a college student, or a medical resident, please join our campus ministry at campus.smsm.nyc. Um, you'll be able to join the WhatsApp and get information of events being held at different campuses across New York City. Um, if you're interested in getting any information, um, you can always join us on social media at SMSM or SMSM NYC. Um, you can join our mailing list at SMSMNYC.com or you can go to our links tree, which has a ton of different sources, resources at links.SMSM.NYC. And finally, if, um, if you would like to donate, you can donate by different sources. We have Easy Tide that you can go through. You can drop a check off or cash a donation box and then through Zelle and Venmo for easy ways to donate for the church. And with that, you could stand up for prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Through the intercessions. O Saint Mary, O Lord, grant us the forgiveness of our sins. We worship you, O Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, for you have come in. A mercy of peace, a sacrifice of, of praise. O Lord, make us worthy to pray. Thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. The love of God, the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the fellowship and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all.